This is Myrna Hampton, and we are in Leadville, Colorado. It's July 19th, and I am talking with Chuck Hampton, who is no relation to me, even though we have the same last name. Chuck? My name is Chuck Hampton. I live in Canada. My, uh, my uh, unit, when I, was, when I was in the 10th Mountain Division, was D Company of the 126th Engineer Battalion. How did you get into the 10th Mountain Division? Well, I was going to I was going to Oregon State University when the, when uh, the draft my number came up in the draft, and I uh, decided that I wanted to be in the Navy Air Force. So uh, when I went to take to take my medical at the the uh, infirmary, the college infirmary, the doctor said, well, you have high blood pressure, you can't be in the Air Force. He said, go home and take a nap. And when uh, you had it about a half hour, two hour nap, come back and I'll take it again, you'll probably be okay. Came back again and my blood pressure was even higher. <laughs> so at that point in time, I thought, you know, I had heard about them recruiting for 10th Mountain Division, I thought, well, you know, if I can't be a flyer, I guess I'd like to be in the mountain division because I've had visions of sliding down the snow, uh, things that I'd done in Mount Rainier because I was born in Tacoma, Washington. I learned how to ski at Mount Rainier. And all of those times, uh, uh, I thought about how much fun it would be to be in the 10th mountain division getting paid for skiing. So I found out you would have to have three letters of recommendation and send them to Minnie Dole, who was in charge of gathering all of the people for the 10th Mountain Division. Where'd you get those three letters of recommendation? Who gave them to you? Uh, I got three letters of recommendation. One was from Harry Brown, who was president of the Brown and Haley Candy Company. They make almond roca candy. Mm -hmm. I got the second one from my future father-in-law, Bob Abel, who was an attorney in, in, in Tacoma, Washington. And I got my third letter from my Uncle Ray Hampton, who was a ranger in the United States Forest Service. Mm. Okay. And I, I sent my letters in a little package back to Minnie Dole and hoped for the best. And what happened? Well, uh, I'm going to say about 10 days later, I, uh, I got a, a, a notice back from Minnie Dole saying that I had been accepted for uh, the 10th Mountain Division. And uh, uh, now he was no longer in control of my future. The future was now up to the United States Army. Oh boy. <laughs> Which was going to happen? Which was going to take take over my life for the next four years, starting at Fort Lewis, Washington. And how old were you? I was 19 years 19. old at the time, and uh, <clears throat> so I, I I went back to Fort Lewis on the day I was supposed to report with another fellow from Tacoma who also had the same reporting date, and we went through the the exercise of getting inducted into the United States Army with the, all of the shots and all of the speeches and uh, all of, this, all of the uh, anti-sex programs that they could choke, choke down and uh, that sort of thing. And we stayed there in Fort Lewis for four or five days while we got finished with all the in introductory uh, programs. And at that point in time, they split off four other guys and myself and put us on the train in Tacoma, Washington and sent us to Pando, Colorado. We got to Pando, Colorado after a, after a day and a night of traveling on a, on a troop train. And uh, we, when we got off, we found that we were all out of breath. We couldn't do anything, move, we couldn't carry our baggage or anything like that. <clears throat> they sent, they'd sent a truck out from, uh, from, from the uh, division and we, they loaded us into the truck and took us to where we, to our final destination in the camp and, because we couldn't have made it walking with all that heavy load. So you really felt the altitude when you got there, too. That's exactly it. Yeah. And uh, it was, I'm going to say, after I got checked in, I, <clears throat> I, was, I was then assigned to uh, H Company, of uh, the Heavy Weapons Company of uh, the 86th Mountain Infantry. And uh, when we got there, Dick Cochran was the first sergeant, and uh, he signed us all in and he assigned us to a bunk. And, showed us how to arrange our things in the foot locker and all the rest of the things that you have to know and issued us the blankets and stuff at the, at the supply room. 
we didn't get our skis, which was a disappointment. Of course, by then it was it was there wasn't that much snow, but they didn't give us our skis of any then at all. They they gave us just blankets and stuff and the, and the and the parkas and things like that that we needed to keep from freezing to death. And from then on, they, from then on, it was a, root, a routine, basic infantry course of indoctrination, which took about three months, I think, in my recollection. What did they indoctrinate you with? Well, uh, of course, you had this. A first aid program was, was key to being an infantry soldier. You had to know how to take care of your own wounds and those of your buddies. So they did. A, they did a couple of three courses on that, and uh, uh, to, to be sure that you know that we could get the basics done until the first aid guy shows up. And uh, then, of course, since we were a heavy weapons company, we we were assigned to be a machine gun company or a machine gun platoon. And uh, so they started out by showing us how to fire a machine gun, which that was a 30 caliber water cooled weapon. And the other fellows in the, in the rest of the division were 80 millimeter mortarmen, and they had to learn how to fire the mortars. And uh, they had a different, a different place that they trained and uh, different routines that they had to learn about because a mortar is a totally different weapon than the machine gun. Uh, there's a bit of a story connected with the mortar. Uh, they, the machine gunners were all gathered together one day and. Captain so took us on a big hike up to where the mortarmen were going to be firing their weapons and showing, them, showing us how they fired their weapons. And we got up there and uh, they had the mortars all set up and they dropped a mortar shell in and it went poof. And we were watching up on the mountainside, nothing happened. And uh, the captain said, put another one in there. So he dropped another one in there and poof. Nothing happened. The captain went running down there and he said, let me have that gun. He fooled around with it and set it up a little bit and dropped one in there. And finally, the thing went boom and blew up on the mountainside. We thought, oh, there's a bunch of mortars. They don't know sick of about this stuff, you know. So we went back to the barracks. And when we got there, there was a bunch of civilians standing around, all just nervous as could be. It turned out that our mortar shells, the ones that had disappeared, had gone into the town of Minturn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and there was quite a commotion about that. Our company command was running around saluting everybody in sight, you know. <laughs> I never did find out what the ultimate outcome was, but we didn't. We moved our mortar range to a different part of, the, of Colorado after that. <laughs> oh my but it, it confirmed what we always thought, that the mortarman didn't know, didn't know sick of about fighting in the war. <laughs> and it turned out that they were pretty good. <laughs> So you went through the three months of indoctrination, and then you probably well, had to do a lot of marching, huh, on hikes? We, yes, you, we had to learn how to march, and we had to learn the left from the right, and all of the things that are, are key to being a good marcher. And we did a lot of close order drill, which is what they call the marching training. And uh, you had to learn the commands that we would hear in the course of marching and things like that. And you know, along with the other classes that we were taking about our weapons and individually, you know, it was, it was a routine, basic training course for an infantry room. Sometime during that period of time, I, I found that uh, one of my, one of my uh, fellow soldiers in, the, in our machine gun platoon was a kid by the name of Dick French from Portland, Oregon, and his brother was the first sergeant of F Company on the H Company. And he had heard that there was an outfit by the name of the 10th Recon being formulated because and they got all of the all of the people with their letters of recommendation together. There was only about six thousand of us. Well, they needed fifteen thousand for a, a full division of soldiers, so they just took the next eight thousand draftees and made them mountain troopers. Oh! And the consequence of that was that we got a lot of people from uh, from the East Coast and from the Deep South and the, the, you know people like that that didn't know anything about the mountains. And we had to train them about mountain warfare and about skiing and rock climbing. And the 10th Recon was being formed as an instructor's company to do all of this. Well, half of the, I'm going to say about half of the instructors were American mountaineers of one sort or forest rangers or whatever like that. And the other half were Europeans uh, of, of, of Austrian, mostly Austrian and uh, uh, descent. And they were expert skiers and things like that. 
but it turns out they couldn't speak very good English either, and so we naturally divided along two lines. In, in the mess hall, why the Europeans sat over on one side and Americans sat over on the other side, and we didn't uh, we didn't get along very well because they thought we were a bunch of spoiled kids, and we thought they were just a bunch of old men. That, you know, and they were probably quite a bit older than you. Well, they were. I'm going to say an average of maybe six or eight years. But the people that were on the European side were guys like Friedel Pfeiffer. European slalom champion, uh, Olaf Rodegaard, who was a Norwegian slalom champion, uh, uh, Fritz Wilhelm, who was an uh, uh, Austrian downhill champion, all kinds of really, you know, world-class skiers. And our side had people like uh, uh, Steve, what, Steve, the guy that built Bill, what's his name? Oh, Pete Siebert, Pete Steve Siebert. Knowlton. Pete, 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 was, Pete was in, in our outfit. Uh -huh. and, uh, he's one of the American guys. And, uh, and then there was myself and Dick French, who were just ordinary skiers from, from the Northwest or wherever. Anyway, we, we never did get along very good with the Europeans. They were doing all their thing, and they all had European friends, and they, and they didn't, they thought we were just a bunch of spoiled kids. And uh, so it, we didn't really get along with them very well, but it, it worked, you know. Mm -hmm. They knew what they were doing. One day uh, at the calisthenics, they had a guy by the name of, uh, uh, I can't think of his name right at the moment, but he was a, he was a European and he couldn't speak very good English and we were going to do the side straddle hop where you stand all in a ready side straddle hop and jump up in the air and clap your hands and then do this thing. And he said, okay, attention now. Hips on shoulders, place. <laughs> everybody started. Everybody started laughing. They said, "This is this is impossible," you know. <laughs> and and the, the first sergeant of our outfit was Walter Prager, and he he could see that the, the situation was out of control, so he called everything in, in, to attention again and got us all straightened out and quit laughing. And, and the, all the Americans were pretty near falling over. We were crying. They were laughing so hard. <laughs> But that's the sort of thing that happened, and, uh, and it didn't stop us from doing our job. Mm -hmm. uh, but those kinds of things were, were a challenge to, to the Americans at any rate. And the Europeans probably you know, thought, well, those young kids, they're no good. Their parents didn't raise them right or something, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. you no know? no respect. Yes, no that's respect. it. That's it. What was your most, um, your most positive, vivid memory of being at Camp Pale? Uh, let me think about that. I guess I guess the most positive uh, memory of it was my time in the in the tenth recon, which was a, a period of about uh, thirteen or fourteen months. Uh, during that time, we in, in the summer when the signs came out, we went down to the Homestead uh, Valley down there, where there's a bunch of nice big rocks. We had a rock climbing school down there, and every week a company of the uh, other soldiers in the division would come down and we'd instruct them in rock climbing. And uh, that part took till the end of the fall when the snow came and then we then we started going to camp up to uh, uh, Cooper Hill and teaching them skiing. So this was all this was all uh, you know a really delightful existence because we were going we were teaching uh, teaching things that we we love to do and, uh, th and it was a, it was an experience in, in frustration Kind of because uh, these guys, some of them, you know, had never been up five feet off the off the, the ground. Uh, I recall a, a little New York guy that was in my class, rock climbing class, and he was he was you know, he was uh, on the way over, marching over to the rock climbing area. He was he was smart assing about this, that, and the other thing. And uh, when he finally got over and saw where we we're going to climb, he said, "No way, I'm going up that." So we finally got his turn, turn to uh, climb. When I dropped my rope. I was up to the top of the, of the little cliff, and I dropped my rope down. And he tied him in down there, and uh, we I snugged it up real tight so he could find it easy to climb. And he climbed up about two steps, and he looked up. And he said, "Let me back down." <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to let him back down because I knew if I'd let him back down, he'd never go up anything. That's right. Yeah. If we finally got him up to the top and then he just returned to his good old personality of being smart about this and that and the other thing, you know, like, okay, okay, you know. 
well, that sort of thing, you know. Uh -huh. uh, but the ordinary, the ordinary uh, un uninitiated soldier would, didn't have any trouble picking up the techniques and things because in <clears throat> getting ready to, to give these instructions, we had a good in set of instructions ourselves from, from world-class climbers. Mm -hmm. Showed us how to tie the knots and how to tie people into the middle of a rope uh, to climb and in tandem and stuff like that. Uh, we were teaching them the right sort of things. And the places that we climbed were not, you know, world-class climbs, but they were sufficient to, to uh, test, test these people to the limit of what they might run into if they got into a combat situation. And, uh, you know, as, as, the, as the war went on and things we went over there, we used that, uh, that information in, in combat when we climbed up River Ridge. Those people had to rope themselves up and climb through the icy, icy cliffs and stuff like that. And I always thought that there was probably people in there that, that I had instructed that never could have made it. Mm -hmm. you know, which may or may not be true, but that was the sort of thing we were trying to prepare them for. Mm -hmm. And it worked. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that can, and, and we finally went back uh, towards the end of our, our tenure, we finally went back to uh, 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 camp in Michigan to train the 76th Division in winter warfare. And they took the whole bunch of us back there and shipped us back uh, to Michigan, upper Michigan, where we taught the, for about six weeks winter warfare. When we were teaching them out in the, out, out in the woods out there. What, uh, ta what year was that then? That, that, was, be... that was 1943, uh, the end of 43 and it started in 44. Mm -hmm. So we, we taught those guys back there, and then they sent us, they sent us back to Camp Hale. And uh, when, when we got back here, back to Camp Hale, uh, we had a new commander. His name was Captain John Jay, who, who may be famous to a lot of people who, because of the movies he made. Captain Jay was our commander, and he was he had a bunch of soldiers back from uh, that he didn't know what to do with. We didn't have any teaching assignments or anything, so he says. Uh, we're going to make a trip from Aspen, Colorado, or from Leadville, Colorado to Aspen. You guys will have to carry everything on your back that you can carry, and it'll take us about five days. And so we got everything packed up and everything that we could carry, and we finally ended up with packs that weighed about 85 or 90 pounds. Oh boy! And, and they were just they were just crucial to carry. <laughs> I can remember the first day everybody was pretty near beat, you know, to where they could hardly hardly walk. You know, as we went further and further on the trip, but the packs got lighter because we were eating the food on the way and stuff like that. But the first night we, we stayed in a little a little mining village up here, uh, up here by uh, home state, no, by uh, no, Massive. We stayed up there, and I was I was sleeping on the floor of a little shack where there were uh, there, was, there was old metal beds and stuff like that laying around it. So we just curled up in there, and I spent in the middle of the night. I felt a little trickle on my nose, and I let a screech out. And it turned out it was, it was a pack rat. And he probably just smelled a little little food on me or something. He was looking around for it. But I never did sleep anymore that night. I just put my head down into my sleeping bag, and, wow. and, and the next day I had a look around, and there were pack mask rests, and pack masks all around in this in the building. There. And they, poor little buggers, they probably were mad at us for interrupting their sleep, you know. <laughs> but that's the sort of thing we did. And uh, towards the end of the trip, we, we got over toward Aspen. We had, we were, there was one range of mountains between us and Aspen, and we camped at the foot of a, of a very big snow field. And uh, Captain Jay the next morning was having a debate with Paul Petzl, who was, uh, who was uh, a sergeant in the, in the medical, and he was long on the trip, about whether they were going to we were going to go up this, this big snowfield or not. And Petzl said, I'm not going up that snowfield, that's going to avalanche. And John Jay said, no, 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 no. So anyway, uh, they, they argued for about 10 or 15 minutes, and all the rest of us guys were standing around waiting for them to settle a problem. And uh, finally John Jay said, uh, okay, uh, any of you want to go with Petzl can go. The rest of you got to come with me. So about, I'm going to say about six or eight guys peeled off and went with Petzl, and they took a route way down around like this before they went up on the cliff. And we started right up the face, zigzag, zigzag, zigzag. And we were, we were walking along really kind of
kind of gently because we didn't want to start any avalanche. And when we finally got to the top, we hadn't started an avalanche, and they were just, you know, about three or four miles below us down here. When we finally got back up, why, we all looked at each other and thought, well, Jesus, you know, John Jay was just lucky to get us up here without getting us all killed. Petzl really, you know, was a, a first-class climber, of a world-class climber. Uh -huh. And so we all stood around up there, and finally, finally we had to go back down the other side, which was very steep. We all had to take our packs off and our skis off and just glissade down the snowfield to get started down. And we finally got down to the bottom where we could put our skis on. Well, we put our skis on and, and skied down a mining road into Aspen, Colorado. And the dogs were barking and everything else, and nobody had ever come to town from this direction mm -hmm. in, the, in the winter. Mm -hmm. And we all ended up in front of the Jerome Hotel. So. Good place to end up, huh? Well, yes, it's the lots worse places, especially the way it turned out, because Larry Elisha was there, and he found out who we were and what we'd done and where we'd come from. He took us in the bar and put two bottles of Seagram Seven Crown on the bar, and we all had a drink. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take before Petzl showed up? Oh, he uh, he got over there. He got over there about. He got over there with us. We waited at the top, oh. him, and he, when he finally got there, it was about an hour and a half later. Mm. But we all came down together, and we all went in, and uh, when when uh, when we we had our drink and everything, when Larry gave us enough rooms to, for each one, each each bunch of guys to gather, you know, that we're sleeping on the floor in our sleeping bags and everything else. But there were about three or four rooms who filled up with those guys, and we were all pretty gamey by that time. We yeah. hadn't had a bath for a week, and we're sweating like murder. You know, <laughs> half we stayed in there at no cost. Oh. And he, he let us he let us use the kitchen to prepare our, our mountain rations, which we did. You know, it was really kind of a, a neat thing to mm -hmm. sit in that big, that fancy old 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 hotel and eat mountain rations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was mm -hmm. really quite an experience. Aspen was pretty quiet in those days. Well, so absolutely. Was, yeah. It had the it had those national tournaments there in uh, in the 1940, I think, something like that. And it, the, the the word had gone out that this was the place to go to ski, and, and of course the war came along, and it all came to a screaming halt. Uh, but they had, at the time, in Aspen, they had what they, they had a snowboat. It started down at the bottom and they had a winch at the top. And they would, everybody would get in the snowboat with their skis and they'd tow you up to the top. Halfway up to the top, it was right below where the zigzag comes in. They'd tow you up there and then you'd get out and walk the whole, whole, whole rest of the way up. And of course, that wasn't the way to, you know, have it in a ski resort. But that's the way they were doing it. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then they finally decided that Friedel Pfeiffer got involved in the development of, uh, of Aspen, uh, among others. And a guy named Walter Papke, uh, he was a millionaire uh, brewery manufacturer or something like that from Milwaukee. He financed the building of that thing. And uh, Friedel was his head guy over there. <clears throat> and this all happened after the war, of course. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it, that's, that's how it got started. So have and you been back to the Hotel Jerome since? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, the whole thing never, the whole thing changed. You know, they, they started developing all the all the real ski areas around there, which are there hundreds of them, yeah. hundreds of them. Yeah. But we we had a we had a you know the, that sort of an experience. We had nothing to do with fighting the war, but it yeah. had something to do with making us good soldiers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after that was all over, why uh, they they decided that they they didn't have any more men to train, so they didn't need to have this trainers group anymore. So they split us all up. Most of the people that were in there went back to their original companies, which were infantry companies. And there were four of us that were in, in, that, in that group that were assigned to the engineers. I was one of them. I have no idea to this day why I went to the engineers, because I was, a, I was an expert machine gunner, and I was a rifle, a sharpshooter in a rifle. I, you know, I, I basically a first-class infantry guy. Hmm. And went to the engineers. I, and I, I wasn't an engineer, had no engineer background or anything else. So I went to the D Company, which is a company I ended up going overseas with, and uh, was assigned to a platoon. Was, uh, the squad, squad leader was uh, Lou, Lou Altman from Cripple Creek, Colorado. You know, and that's where I started. And I was a buck private, you know, that was my rank when I went into the 10th Recon, and it was a rank when I came out. Nobody got a, a, a promotion while they were there, and mm -hmm. nobody cared about it. You know, we were having fun. Man. The, the time Sounds like you were having fun, sure. The time of my life. So, did you practice doing um, trams and things up? In I camp? didn't know. Did I didn't know sick of about it? Ah. And uh, the, the people who were doing it were, 
guys in the first platoon, and I was in the third platoon. Oh. The guys that were in the first platoon had had a, had some practice on the equipment, which was made by uh, a Denver manufacturer, <laughs> and they had two or three different styles of trams, uh, all based on a, a Continental aircraft engine to power the tram up and down. And then uh, they had the different kinds of styles of carriage and things like that. And they had uh, a transit and sort of thing to, to shoot the grade. And the, everything had to be done pretty well exactly right or you would be dragging the carriage on the ground and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The first platoon knew all about that. The rest of us were just general engineers. That is, uh, we, we were a heavy equipment company and a lot of, a lot of the guys were bulldozer operators and road grader operators, things like that. And then some of us were just dumb engineers, you know, which is what the ordinary average engineer is, just a dumb guy, you know. And that's okay, you know. Mm -hmm. It was just dumb work, dreamt work was what all we were doing. <clears throat> but when, the, uh, when I got transferred, finally I was made a corporal. And uh, I was assigned to be uh, assistant, assistant uh, squad leader to, uh, to the, first, the first platoon squad leader. So I was assistant to him. And his name was uh, Waldich, Mark Waldich. So I was his assistant squad leader, and uh, all of the time, I was you know, we were we were we were sent finally <coughs> after uh, after we were pretty well organized in <coughs> in Camp Hill. They sent us back to <coughs> Camp Henry, Camp Camp Patrick Hill, Virginia, where we worked with a bunch of uh, e experts from Washington D.C. We called them boffins because all they did was invent new ways of blowing up mines. <laughs> and we would go out and plant a minefield. <coughs> we'd go out and plant a minefield and then we'd, we would blow it up. And then we'd go dig up the mines and see how many got exploded. And we, <coughs> we, used, we, we invented and perfected uh, two or three different systems that they used overseas finding. The Germans had more or less brought the things of the European war to a stop over there. Uh, because of the mines were bothering him. What we invented was a, was a system that uh, we called a, uh, a uh, snake. And we, we, we would push this snake, we would made a, a guardrail, and you would bolt these guardrails together and you put uh, TNT blocks in all between the guardrails. And you push it out and there was a little target down at the bottom uh, it would be a tank that pushed it out there and he'd shoot that target and it would blow this thing up. And if you pushed it across the minefield, you blew the minefield up. Mm. And they used them over overseas a lot. And uh, they used one, they used one, another one that we invented where, where you fill the fire hose with nitroglycerin and then you took a, uh, you took a mortar shell and took all the powder out of it and put, put the mortar shell back into a little trough and tied it onto the bottom of this, this nitroglycerin filled hose and shoot it out over the minefield. And then you blew that up. Mm -hmm. I mean, that blew the mines up too. Mm -hmm. We did that quite a bit over in Italy. Mm -hmm. So you know, those things were those things were all invented by D Company of, of the 126 while we were back in Washington D.C. And uh, finally, they uh, finally they decided that was no good to have those guys just larging around by just going, going to Virginia Beach to play with the girls down there on the weekends. So they sent us back to Camp Hill. And, uh, and we were we were not D Company at the time. We were the 226 engineers. So they be, we became D Company in Camp Hale at that time. And uh, we were still a heavy heavy weapons company or heavy uh, machinery company and that sort of thing. But after that, we did regular training with the, at Camp Swift uh, with the rest of the division to get ready to go overseas, which we did. And uh, we we got overseas uh, about the 15th of January. 1945, and we landed in Naples. And uh, do you remember the ship that you were on? Mm -hmm. Do you remember the ship that you were on? Sure, the, 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 the General Miggs, Miggs, M E I G S, Miggs, mm -hmm. and it was loaded right to the right to the top. Did you and get seasick? No, I didn't, but I, I had to quit smoking. I, 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 it's ter it tasted terrible. I had to quit smoking. Mm -hmm. One of the experiences going overseas that I never forget is that we were we were in the very bottom hole and to climb up to the to, to the mess hall, which was way up here. We had to go th through a bunch of real places like this. Well, there's a bunch of guys that had been eaten up there before, 
And as they were walking down, they were puking up their breakfast and it was coming down, <laughs> raining down through the metal drill work oh, and everything on those guys God. below. <laughs> oh, gee. And it was a little unpleasant. You didn't really, so you got up there, you weren't all that hungry, you know? I bet not. <clears throat> and the other thing was, we had to walk through the latrine and there would be, you know, all you could see was a line of butts sticking out of the cans. The guys were puking in the toilets. <laughs> Forget about the other Yeah, well, you know, life overseas and all that oh, good, you know. Oh, no. So a lot of the guys got seasick then, huh? Oh, it is. There was a little guy in my squad. I was a sergeant by that time. There was a little guy in my squad, a little Italian kid named Joe Martino. And uh, he got sick walking up the gang at the gangplank in Newport News, Virginia. And he, he never cured. Oh, my gosh. And he was still sick when we got there. And they, they finally had to start feeding him with a vein, uh, in the vein with uh, uh, intravenous. So he wouldn't die. He was oh, starved to death. My gosh! And uh, you know there there were cases in between there, and, and, and people like me that just had to quit smoking or uh -huh. something like that. That's a rough crossing going across. The well, it was. It was until we got to, through the case of uh, the Straits of Gibraltar, then it smoothed out a little bit. Mm -hmm. But you know it took us 13 days to get there, mm -hmm. and we we didn't have to go in a convoy because the General Miggs was a fast freighter, and it could outrun submarine. So we didn't have, we weren't in the convoy, but they were always watching for submarines, of course. So we made a better, a faster crossing than a lot of people mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. And when we got there, why well, we had to unload and uh, all You our, landed in Naples. And yeah, and we, they, we, we had to march about three or four miles up to the uh, rail terminal where we got out of those little, little tiny boxcars that they use in Europe. And uh, there, was a, there was about a platoon of men in each one of the little old boxcars. Finally got all loaded. They started up, and uh, the next thing we knew, I looked out the door, or the open door there, and I see this leaning tower of Pisa. Knew exactly where we were. Oh. We unloaded there and uh, put put our bivouac right in in the shade of the leaning tower of Pisa. Oh. And, uh, stayed there till we got all our gear together. Then had to gather it up and get it all in one place. So had the engineers repaired the tracks? Hadn't the Germans torn the train tracks up, or? Well, sure. We, we didn't have any railroads. We didn't have any railroads. Uh, see, we were talking. We we're talking about from Naples to Pisa. We owned that part of the world, uh -huh. and uh, they had fixed up the railroad to, to get sufficient transportation to get there. Mm -hmm. And but uh, from there on, there weren't any railroads. We were we were at the, at the, at the south end of the Apennine Mountains, and uh, they'd be blown everything up there for sure. So. We didn't have to worry about that because we had plenty of trucks and uh, stuff like that to do all of the transporting that we needed to do. And we stayed there for, I'm going to say, a week and uh, we, the engineer bunch went down to uh, Lobarno to the coast and practiced uh, lifting mines out there, a bunch of minefields down they wanted cleared. So we found the mines and cleared the minefields and, and that sort of thing. They had, we had one a tragic incident down there where six guys got blown up. They did it wrong, mm -hmm. which can happen, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And one of them, as a matter of fact, was a uh, was a uh, preacher, the, the Catholic priest for the for the division. Oh. So we had to go get a new guy for that job. Oh. The other oh. guys were just soldiers, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then we then they decided that uh, we were fully fully trained or trained enough to go in the lines, and we went up to. Uh, to the by truck to a little town called Mamiano Abasso, which is Mamiano the lowest. And uh, we, we all were put into, our company was all put into a, 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 probably a three-story house. And uh, we stayed in there while we did some work and we were, you know, a couple of miles behind the front lines when we got there. So we were able to go up to the front lines and uh, their infantry positions who were up there doing the guarding and everything on the front lines. We had to build little roads around and things like that and, and find minefields for them and things like that. And we did that till uh, I'm going to say for about 10 days. Then they moved us over to, uh, to the place where we were going to get into the real war. And we moved to Vidichiatico, which is just south of the uh, River Ridge. And we were big black in a little farm farmer's house there and uh, my squad had the whole house and the other squads were in other whole houses, little farmhouses. 
and the old man, and there was an old man and his wife there. Uh, that I don't know where they were living. They were living in their bedroom, I guess. And uh, but every day they came out and they had little one of those little things that looked like a little hibachi, and they were they fill it with charcoal, and the old lady would come out and fan them like that, and they would raise the, the goddamnest smoke and fumes you ever. We had to leave. The, mm -hmm. Our eyes were watering and everything like that. It was terrible, you know. Mm -hmm. The Italians were used to it. That must have been the reason that all of their lives. Didn't mm -hmm. bother them. So that was their heating source, or they were cooking with cooking. Both. 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 But, ah. but they didn't have that much. They didn't have that much charcoal, so they didn't do a lot of heating. Of course, uh -huh. we had our, our sleeping bags, so we weren't cold. Uh -huh. But it was it was it was nasty bivouac, and uh -huh. it was right in the dead of winter. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And, uh, all that stuff. And I remember I had I had my wife's picture. I got married before I went overseas, and I had my wife's picture, and I set it up on her mantle. And the old man come in, came in one day and he said, Ah, molto bello. <laughs> Very beautiful. Uh. And he wanted to know who it was. I said, This is my wife, you know. And then he said, Let me go. Of course, Joe Martino, my little Italian guy, he was telling me what he was saying all the time, you know. It turned out that he thought he's, he's a very lucky man, you know. Oh. And uh, I agreed with him. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, those people, I couldn't find them. I've been back to Vinnie Chanico a couple of times and I, I really didn't know where they lived and they probably were had passed away because they were quite old. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but I would have been interested to go down there and look at the little place we'd hold up there. Mm -hmm. And it's hard there because all the trees have grown so much. Oh, absolutely. Very oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It had all changed. And uh, so I, the last time I was over there, or the, or the next to last time I was over there, I took my two boys with me, Charlie and Bruce. They were anxious to climb Mount Ray, uh, climb the Riva Ridge, and uh, so they climbed Riva Ridge. And when they came down, they were mo mucking around on the bottom, and they found the big rock, which we had used for the base station for the trip for the tramway. And we nobody had ever known them. And, you know, everybody that lived there knew about it, but uh, nobody could have ever found it. So could they, they tell by the marks on there that? They're... No, they knew it. There, there's only big rock in the oh. in the whole. In the, uh -huh. it's, on a, it's on a steep ground, and this is a little farm, and here's this big rock there, and, mm -hmm. it, and that was the only rock in the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they had no trouble identifying it. So uh, they they found it, and uh, subsequent to that, why well, I, I talked with John uh, uh, John Embry about the thing, and he said, well, uh, he said, well, why don't you make a memorial? Put it on there, and I thought, well, sure, why not? So we started. About, started about uh, right away. I started emailing my my, my uh, engineer friends in various parts of the country, and finally got a, a, a in touch with a guy in Kentucky who was in the funeral business, and he knew how to get bronze memorials made wholesale. <laughs> so we designed. Phil Lundy, our engineer, designed the the plaque, uh -huh. and we had the whole thing cast and. We took it over there with us, over to Italy, and uh, arranged to stay in the Monte Grande Hotel at Vidi Chiatico. And Bruno Bartolome uh, arranged to have uh, a priest there to do the dedication. He arranged for the mayor of Misano to be there, uh, the, arch, the, uh, the, the, the cops to be there, the head cop, and all the rest of them. We had a, we had a nice presentation. and. Uh, uh, there were movies taken of it, and many, many uh, silent still films and stuff like that. And it, it took us all day, and they had a nice little lunch and uh, plenty of vino rosa to drink mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And uh, it was a most pleasant experience, mm -hmm. most pleasant. And they were all so kind and, and, and solicitous of us, you know. And we never had thought at the time that we'd done anything. Mm -hmm. but, it turns out that we uh, had built the tramway, and it, it, it was a very, a very, it was the first tramway ever built in combat. Mm. That one was the first one ever. How did you do it? Well, it was simple enough. Uh, once we found the site, and they, they spent about three days uh, making transit shots up these up these mountains of, of Riva Ridge, these various mountains. So they found one in Campo de Basso, Campo de Basso. and. Uh, it had it had it was a little bit concave. It had a little slope in it so that we didn't have to clear a bunch of brush and everything because we were up up above it. The line was from the top to the bottom was straight, and it was going over the lower part. So we we found that, and uh, when we found that, we knew we had a place we could use. The trouble was that it, that it, it ran out of uh, we ran out of uh, 
of uh, suitable terrain before we got to the top. The flat tramway itself was about 1,700 feet long, and there was about another, I'm going to say, uh, four or five hundred vertical feet between there and the top of the mountain, where the guys were going to be up there fighting. So we, we, we knew we had to do something, so we just built as much as we could. Mm. And the consequence was that, uh, that the 86th uh, Infantry 1st Battalion went up there and did all the fighting. And uh, when, it, when it all came down to the, to the counting down, it turned out that we had brought down uh, something like 22 bodies, and we brought down about 55 wounded men. So it was a very worthwhile very worthwhile uh, effort. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we ran the thing, we ran the thing, uh, I'm going to say about two weeks, which is, as, as one, one, in two weeks they had the Germans run out of there, which, and, and Mount Belvedere attack had taken place, and uh, the Germans couldn't do a near, nearly as good a job of spotting their artillery because up there on River Ridge they had a full view of Mount Belvedere and they could see us going up there and they knew exactly where to shoot their ball. Mm -hmm. their, 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 Guns, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was a very worthwhile effort. And uh, of course, the, the the accomplishments of the 86th Infantry up there are, are legendary, and they should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the way it was. And uh, <clears throat> we moved we moved several times in the course of uh, you know, the course of the war. We moved over <clears throat> to Gaucho, Montana, where we stayed while they made the next phase of the attack. In the Apennines, which went to uh, went up in the mountains some more, we ended up putting our tramway across a uh, piece of the road that went up and looped up into the German territory, and we put the tramway across our part of it and used it for for supplies because the road the road that went back and forth went up there too, and we couldn't drive up there with our truckloads, mm -hmm. so we just unload them and tramp transfer them across and, and do our supplies that way. We, we did that until until the 14th of April, which, which they were all getting ready for uh, uh, for the final attack. And by that time, we'd moved to uh, uh, to Riala, a place called Riala, which was a bunch of grape orchards and stuff on the side of the mountain. And uh, our role uh, at that time was for on the attack was to back up the 87th Infantry Division on their attack through Torreusi which is right in the middle of the, of the, of the attack. And uh, it, we, we were supposed to do all of the engineering work that, uh, that they, whatever it was required. We ended up having to uh, clear a couple of minefields and uh, stuff like that, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, anything to do with the tramway at, at that point in time. After a couple of days of that, uh, of that attack, we, we pushed the Germans back and they finally finally got uh, a little more room to do what we were trying to do, which is to, is to push the whole front back. Uh, we were got, we at the time were about, I'm going to say, like six or eight miles ahead of all of the rest of the forces. We were out there, we were just like a little thing out there fighting the war. And when we finally got to the Po Valley, why well, we kind of straightened the line out, you know. And from there on, from there on, we were just, uh, our, the D company didn't have a bunch of engineer work to do, but uh, some of the other companies had to, had to uh, defuse the, the, the explosives on several bridges, which they did. And uh, when we finally got to the Po River, uh, the general was, he was really kind of mad because he had been stopped dead in his tracks and he was going like gangbusters up the, ba up the valley. So he called, uh, called our, our battalion commander in and he said, uh, uh, how long is it going to take you to get across here? He said, well, we've got to go get some boats. We, we didn't have any boats. We, we'd gone ahead so fast we didn't have any backup with us. So uh, he, the general sent, uh, sent uh, a couple of our officers back on a jeep to find some boats. And they were going back down the road maybe uh, for an hour or two, and they came upon a convoy of boats, of all things, coming up the road. There were about ten truckloads of boats, and uh, our, our, our officer got out and hollered, and said, come on, I know where to go. So he, he, he got the old convoy commander, and he said, follow me. 
He took them right to where we wanted them to go, and then loaded the boats, and we took these boats from the 85th Division. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> they were really sore about that, you know. <laughs> they did no sense of humor. <laughs> but we got, the, we got the boats, and uh, when, when uh, our major we went to see the general. He said, we got the boats, the general. And he said, well, let's just go. I want to go. And he said, we can't do it. We haven't got the boats deployed. We haven't got the troops deployed. And uh, the general said, well, how soon can you go? And uh, he said, well, we, we probably go about noon. He said, the general said, that's when we're going. And that's what we did. <laughs> our, our company, a D company, was, uh, was the first ones to land the boats. Mm. And we ended up, when, uh, they were good-sized boats. And uh, there were there were three engineers in each boat. One guy, which was a sergeant, I was steering in our boat, and a, and a couple of, of uh, regular soldiers to paddle. And then there were twelve infantrymen that take a whole squad of men. Mm -hmm. and we wow, went. those are big boats. Huh? Well, they were, they were, and they were they, they were they were canvas covered with over wood and stuff like that. So they floated kind of high. And you know, when when we got out in the river a little bit by the 88 cannons, which the Germans had deployed on their side of the river, started firing air bursts at us. And uh, they were using an anti-aircraft am ammunition, which had aluminum casings, and they didn't make big chunks of shrapnel, they made little tiny chunks. And they, boy, they'd blow it up and the water would jump all around you, mm. you know, stuff like that. And one of them blew right over our boat, and uh, one of the infantry got running got a chunk of shrapnel in his leg, and he stood up. And he had his pack on his back, and he fell overboard. And uh, they went by him, I grabbed a hold of his pack sack like that, and kind of trolled him in with me all the way down to the shore. Only had about 100 yards to go, we were almost over yeah. there, and, and pulled him up on the beach, and he was coughing and spitting up water like crazy. <laughs> you know? And I said, hey, uh, there's a first aid post on the, on the, on the, on the back here, if I can take you back with us, you ought to go. And he said, not in a million years, you take me back. You didn't want to go back across that No mountain. way, he said. <laughs> So he didn't go back in, and we went back and made one more trip, and then I got, and then I, I was finished. I'd, I'd had enough of that, so we got another crew to take over our boat. Uh, so did they ferry the rest of the 85th Division on those boats then too? Oh sure. Oh. oh after okay. after they yeah after it was all after we were across we were we were pretty near to Verona before they ever got across. <laughs> but you know that's the way it is. Our, uh -huh. our general was was he he was a go getter. I'm mm -hmm. telling you he was. You know, he didn't want to get stuck, mm -hmm. and he didn't let it happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, the thing, and it was really something. That I, I remember going up to the riverbank when we when we finally drove up there. There was nothing but German equipment. As far as you, I could see, they they'd gone as far as they could go, and I don't know how did they get across. I have no idea. But there was every doggone type of German equipment, guns, everything on there. Hmm. And, you think they uh, swam? <laughs> I, well, they must have. Yeah. They must have, I don't, but they didn't also. They left all the equipment. Sure. Now this is when things were getting shaky though, when they were surrendering, they were giving up quite a bit. Well, they were, you know, there was a certain amount of prisoners, we were getting a certain amount of prisoners all the way up after we, after we left the Apennines. It was all, you know, river plain. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, there was pretty, he pretty heavy combat going on there too, because everybody was, had, had plenty of train to move around in. And uh, I remember we pulled into one billboard one night, and we looked across the field there a little bit, and here's a bunch of guys over there. I thought, well, not a bunch of. Turned out a bunch of Germans over there, and they're camping over there. And we started shooting at each other. <laughs> you know that kind of stuff was happening all the time, uh, and nobody knew where everybody else was because uh -huh. they were, we were all going in so fast and everything. Uh -huh. And uh, it, that's the way it was. Uh -huh. It, got, it was pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. I bet so. Yeah. I bet so. Then when you went to Verona, what happened there then? Well, in Verona, we, we were well ahead of everybody else, and uh, the town. Were there many Ver Germans in Verona, or were they? Pretty they much had left. They had left. They had left, and uh, our our infantry troops were, were fighting up up on the Adige River and as uh, far up as uh, as uh, Busolingo, which is up up almost halfway to Lake Garden, and uh, engineers were kind of following along, and uh, we went down into the town down there, and uh, my squad and I, and we stopped, and a couple of, a couple of uh, Italians came up, and they were shaking hands and kissing their hands and all that kind of crap, and he had this glass like this full of some kind of liquid and everything, he wanted me to drink it, I said, I drank it, it was a whole bloody glass full of grappa, 
Oh, she shook me right up, like tears started running down my cheeks. <laughs> the church, I said, he just wanted to be nice to us, you know. <laughs> and and, and another, while we were there, why well, a couple of Germans came up, and they came up out of a cellar someplace, and they wanted to surrender. And uh, so we, you know, we we didn't have any any uh, means of taking care of uh, prisoners. We were on the move, so we just turned them over to the. A bunch of guys were following us and said, you take these guys back to the prisoner cage, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they were all pretty well gone, uh, the Germans, they were, they, were all, they were all across the river and uh, they, were making, they were making their move on uh, Lake Garda. And uh, when we finally got to Lake Garda, we, uh, we, we found that tunnel number one that we got to had been blown shut. And uh, it was our job at that point in time because we had the heavy equipment to open the tunnel. And uh, our, our battalion commander, John Parker, uh, went back to see the general and he says, uh, Colonel, how long will it be before you get that uh, tunnel open? And uh, Parker said, it'll be three or four days, General. The general said, you're relieved. You're out of here. And I'll be out of the, be out of the division area by probably tomorrow. Fired our, he fired our colonel. Because he was going to take too long? Well, whatever. I think oh. he was kind of mad. Uh, the, the story behind it, you know. Uh, the general, uh, our, our battalion commander was a West Pointer. The general was a, was a Mustang. He was not a West Pointer. Mm -hmm. And he hated West Pointers. Oh. And our commander was a West Pointer. <laughs> and he'd probably been laying in the weeds there for, for the whole bloody war trying to figure out how, how he could. to get rid of them, huh? Uh, that's 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 my that's the story that I get ah, from, from okay. Platt Boyd, who was our who was our uh, battalion commander after he fired our good guy. Ah. But John Parker uh, has come to a couple of our reunions over the years, and I've had a chance to visit with him a lot. He he uh, he was a victim of, of poor operation procedures when he went to the vet veterans hospital to get his back fixed, and they made him a, a wheelchair prisoner. Oh. But oh. uh, he was a fine man, I oh. remember, absolutely first class officer. Mm. And, mm. Uh, but you know, that's, that's the way the war is. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> mm. So how long did it take you to clear that tunnel? Well, we worked on that tunnel for about uh, about three days. And we finally got it where we could get the bulldozer started in, in, uh, into the open part of the tunnel. And then it went pretty quick. But we had, it, we had to take it all down piece by piece because we didn't know what was behind there was going to fall in on right. it. And it took about three days to get it open to that far. And in the meantime, while the Germans were, were, were fighting the war up, up further up towards the end of the, the north end of the lake. With, and, where Riva del Garda is? That's right, that's right, in Torboni, mm -hmm. more particularly. And uh, what we did later, uh, earlier, before we got the tunnel open, we brought a great big barge, and I don't have any idea where they got it, but it was a great big barge, metal barge with no, no power on it or anything. But made a little landing there down by our bivouac and we built a little ramp so that we could get up in the thing and, and we brought a tank up and we ran this tank up and he put it on this barge and we got it on the barge and then we put two ducks, on, one on each side of this barge and we started up the lake with it in the middle of the night. And I was, uh, I was in, in charge of the barge and going up there and uh, it was pitch black and you couldn't see the shore or anything. And, uh, you know, thinking all the time, how am I going to get these guys to slow down and stop or something, you know? I finally figured out, well, I guess if I could get up in the front, I'll go in there, but I light a match or something, they'll, they'll stop. And I went and told them, I figured, I'm going to get up here in the bow here, and when I light a match, cut the engine. And I got up there in the front, and uh, I lit a match, and somebody in the said, who lit that fucking match? <laughs> he didn't like it. <laughs> I, I never told her who lit it, but I sure, sure put it out in a hurry. <laughs> but anyway, we got to the shore and we tied the, t tied the barge up to the, to the landing. And that was, this was in Torboli. And we tied the barge up to the landing and put the landing lines in and tied them on, on bolsters, whatever we could find. And the tank started crawling up on it and it started got towards the front of the barge. The barge kept sinking down, sinking down. Mm. And finally, the tank was going to have to go up and let, like this, you know. So he, he, he got started up there, and just about at the time he got halfway up there, one of the dogs on tie line broke. 
and the bars started coming out underneath him. Oh, my so he just gunned the motor and he, boom, <laughs> he, he got him and he started balancing the other. Finally, he tipped out. Like he a got, teeter totter, huh? Finally, oh. he got tipped out. <laughs> that was something. We finally got we finally got him unloaded. And then we then we sure we got the barge back out of there. Went back, you know we were we were all finished with that exercise. Mm -hmm. It was going to be daylight the next day, and you couldn't get out there on the lake and start doing stuff like that because the Germans had a bunch of artillery on the other bank, and they were shooting their pot shots at us all the time while we were trying to clear the tunnel. They mm -hmm. could see our dust coming up, and they were lobbing stuff in there. And it was kind of it was mm -hmm. kind of spooky. You know? Yeah. Now there were five or six tunnels then, weren't there? Oh yeah, and uh, there were there's two or three others that had minor minor uh, destruction on them, but none that was worse the worse than the tunnel. Tunnel number one was the whole nine yards, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a there was an incident where where uh, in one tunnel there was a bunch of Germans in it, and our, our artillery fired a shell and it went in the tunnel, exploded, and they killed a whole damn bunch of them in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we had to go in there to uh, Seen the dog on top of the bulldozer, one of our bulldozer operators. He said, "God, give me a mask or something." You yeah. had to have something on his face because they oh, stunk so bad, you know. Gosh, <laughs> yeah, well, that must have been grim work. Well, huh? it is, you know. Yeah. It, 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 mm. So you know, things like that, uh, things like that, are uh, memories that I've had over over the years. Mm -hmm. that's, what that's all about. But you know, when we finally got when we finally got the uh, late. Uh, Lago de Garda, the, the end of it, Garda City cleaned up and Torboli cleaned up and stuff like that. The Germans were on the way up, north, up, up as far as they could go, and we were chasing them up there rapidly. Finally got them, after two or three days, by, they, they finally we got them cornered up there and they had to quit. And uh, when, we were, when they got them quit, well, they started coming back down and they were going to be prisoners of war. And uh, I was in, uh, I was in Riva with my squad of guys and a whole, a, a whole platoon or uh, maybe it been a company, the Germans came down and indicated they wanted to surrender. So, you know, we didn't have any way of taking care of that bunch of guys and everything. So uh, I finally decided I would take uh, the, the commander and his assistant or how many of her, a couple of three of the officers and put them in one of our little trick of boats and I was going to take them back down where the prisoner cage was, which was halfway down the lake. So he got him in there and we got out in the, in the lake and the uh, uh, wind came up and the waves were about you know three or four feet high and, and about that time when the outboard motor quit and uh, I figured it was, had some water in the gas or something like that and I kept cramping and cranking and cranking and finally got it going. By that time we had taken a little water over the side and one of the Germans were, was uh, sitting there and she he was kind of sobbing bitterly and it, and I could speak German, so I asked him, well, what's the matter with the guy? He, said, he can't swim. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I said, well, he, he's in tough luck because we don't have any life jackets. You know? <laughs> and it, we, we never did. We never did have any emergency, but it was, you know, it was a close thing. It's I, went, scary I then, for him. took the boat in closer to the shore as I could get. You know, mm -hmm. and went, went along like that. Mm -hmm. We didn't really get away, but you know. <laughs> Oh, I finally got the guys down there, the, the Germans down there, I took them to the prisoner cage and, and the guy said, oh, Jesus, more? They didn't want any more prisoners. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, so that's I, I, hard. I, I mean, how do you, what do you do with all those? Well, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So the prisoner's cage is a compound. I mean, it's Yeah, a, they had barbed wire around the place. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that's yeah. what it was called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we called it. I don't mm -hmm. know what, it was probably, probably some government name for it, for all I know. Mm -hmm. That's what we called it. Mm -hmm. But we had a we had a good got of prisoners, but there were most of them the, the most of them that were up there in the north part of the, of the valley up there were still there when they surrendered, and I don't know what happened to those guys because uh, after the war was over, it, the war was over in the second of, Mar of May, and uh, after the war was over, we we pulled back down out of there, and that's when they went over to the uh, eastern shore of Italy over to. To Yugoslavia, to Trieste? Yeah, yeah, that's when we got over in mm -hmm. there. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we were camped on the Asanza River there, and the Yugoslavians were on the other shore, and we were glaring to each other. And we were flying airplanes over the top of them, and tanks were running up and down mm -hmm. and trying to scare them. We finally got them scared enough to give up. Mm -hmm. 
after that when we were, we were the whole whole thing was all over. But mm -hmm. so we formed the baseball league and did things. I guess you guys did a lot of rock climbing there too. Huh? We did, we did, uh, and we had a ski tournament up at the bottom of Vanguard. Uh, I did a little downhill course up there. School, there's plenty of plenty of up in the Dome White Alps right there, you know. Mm. And uh, there's plenty of rock climbing going on. And there was, was for if you wanted to go on a, on a, on a overnight pass or something like that, you'd go and do whatever you wanted to do. Mm. I, I did some rock climbing while I was over there. Mm -hmm. You know, you, wherever you wanted to go, you didn't have to go very far. You'd find a real nice place to climb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Where were you when you learned that the war was over? How did you learn that the Germans had Well, we were. We I mean, were uh, we we were up there. We were up there in, at the end of Lake Garda mm -hmm. when, it, when, it all, when it all stopped. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had we had our troops were deployed up in the north part there, still still crowding as hard as we could on the Germans. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, uh, uh, there was a lot of trouble getting all of us uh, all advised that the war was over. Mm -hmm. And there was a, there was a, there was a, a lot of. Mm. Even course, after the war was over, because the Germans hadn't gotten the word that that was. That's right. You couldn't yeah. get it around. The yeah. communications were all that like good, and it was it was uh, it was a day or two, two before the war was over that Colonel Darby got killed mm -hmm. in Torboli, mm -hmm. and uh, so you know he damn near made it. Mm -hmm. he damn near 